what would it actually be like to write a VCS game? I wish I'd never started now. We've done some interesting vintage game videos with yep. uh, Matt Phillips on the Sega Mega That's Drive. Right, Tanglewood. It's similar in some ways, uh, different in others. Obviously, he was using the original hardware and software to try and develop. He dug out an old PC, the SCSI card, the connection things to do it. I've gone for a different approach. So I'm writing it in 6502 Assembler, which is the same with the CPU it uses, or, well, a variant of it. We'll look at the hardware in more detail in another computer file. But I'm writing it in there, and I'm emulating it using main to generate my display. So I'm writing the software, compiling it using a modern machine, so I've got all the nice friendly tools, and then I've written a couple of tools to generate the ROM image, which we can then feed into MAME to generate things. MAME aims to emulate the electronics very low level, so it tries to be as accurate as possible in its emulation, which is good in this case. I don't have an actual console, but I do have, courtesy of the wonders of the internet, a copy of the circuit diagram, and it's not that complicated a machine. You've got the 6507 CPU. As far as the program is concerned, it's a 6502 CPU, the same as we found in the Commodore 64 in the BBC Micro, Nintendo, various different things at the time. The special thing about the 6507 is that it had a slightly reduced number of pins, so it didn't have the full 16-bit address bus. It's only got 13 bits available, which means you haven't got quite so much memory and so on. In terms of actually writing the software for it, programs more or less the same. You've also got the 6532, which again is a standard chip, which provides some I.O. And it also provides all the RAM for the system, which is 128 bytes. Yes, 128 bytes. Not kilobytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes. 128 bytes. That's challenging to code for, then. Where do you, where do you start with a thing like that, then? Well, so the first thing you have to remember is that actually that's not the only memory you've got. So that's your RAM. That's where you can store. So that's where you store your variables and you can manipulate and store data there. What you've also got is the game cartridge itself, which is in fact a ROM chip, which I have sitting here. These are bigger than you'd need. These are 32K EEPROM chips. You only get 4K allocated on the 2600. So you've got to write your game or your program for the 2600 to run in 4K of memory to store the code, but you can't change that. So all your code, your graphics, your data, has sounds have to be stored in that 4K, you can't change it. There are ways that came later where you can sort of bank switch to actually have more storage, but you have to program that and build the hardware yourself. On the base machine, the base cartridge, you've got 4K of ROM, which you can't change, and 128 bytes of memory, which you can use to store things. Now, that may sound not too bad, and you think, well, okay, if I want to write something like Pong, which is what the sort of games that it was originally designed for, I need to store the position of bat one, bat two, the position of the ball, and that's probably three. But the other thing you have to remember is that when you call subroutines and things in a machine code program, you need space to store where you've got to return to. We looked at this in a previous video. That normally goes on the stack, and you've also got to fit that stack on the thing. And the way the 6502 stack works is it starts counting down from one ff in hex down and so that meets up with your variables coming from 80 or so in hex and they sort of meet in the middle so you've not actually got that much space you have to keep track of things fairly carefully so that's the sort of standard stuff the thing that makes the 2600 the 2600 is it's got this chip in the middle the tia the television interface adapter and that's what generates the graphics that you see and the sound that you hear on screen when playing the games. The system runs the software on the 6502 with the RAM in there from the program in the cartridge and you have to drive the TIA chip to generate the display on screen. Simple, you might think, but this is not a computer like say a BBC Micro or a C64 where you've actually got a, a display where you can write characters into or you can set pixels on and off. No, this is very much a low level thing, you have to program basically the whole video signal system that you would see on your screen almost by hand, including turning the synchronization signals on that start the screen in the right place and make sure it actually looks right. And if you get that wrong, you won't produce a valid video signal that your TV would recognize and so the display would go all skew if. And worst case scenario, it wouldn't be impossible to make the TV catch fire if you got it really wrong. Whether it would actually catch fire, probably not, but you could certainly do some nasty things if you got it wrong. So the other thing, just like Matt was saying with the Sega, is that the cartridge is everything. 
when you put the cartridge in, the CPU is connected directly to it and it starts executing the code from the cartridge. So there's no operating system there. So you have to set this, everything up yourself. So the first thing you have to do on the program is literally zero the memory, turn off the interrupts and so on, and just make sure everything is set up. And then you have to go into what was often called the kernel of the 2600 and start programming it to display things. So if I get the programmer's manual, which again, from the wonders of the internet, you can get a copy of. The TIA chip, or Stellar, I think it's sometimes referred to in the 2600, will generate the horizontal sync. Everything else you're responsible for. So it's generating one line of the image, and then it will start the next line. If you want anything to appear in there, you have to program that chip to generate that pattern that you want to expect. And then when you get to the next line, you have to generate the bits on the next thing until you build it up to build up the whole image. You sort of scan down the thing. And if you look at a CRT in slow motion, you will see it scanning down, building up the image bit by bit, and then building it up bit by bit. It's a bit like ASCII art, isn't it? You know, you go along, you put what you want in the right place, and you press a carriage return, and you carry on. And Yeah, I mean, that's one, that's one way of thinking about it. You're filling up the whole screen 50 times a second, and you have to generate everything within those 312 and a half lines to generate the images. Again, PAL speak, 625 lines on the screen, 50 fields of half a frame, and so on. Go and watch the video on interlacing. Well, we can assume it's got 312 lines that we scan. And if you look at this diagram, then you have to make sure that a vertical sync happens for three scan lines. And then you have a black bit, which is basically telling the screen to make sure nothing is drawn as it refreshes back up to the top left of the screen to start drawing things again. And then you start drawing your picture, and you've got a little bit of space while the sync happens and you have to set all the data up to draw the first line, go back to the next line, start drawing the second line, and so on, all by hand. There's no support here other than you can say to the TIA, wait for the horizontal sync, and it will pause the CPU's execution until that happens and then start executing the program again. So you have to write your code to do this, literally drawing the screen line by line. You then have 30 lines which you won't see on the TV because they're off the bottom of the picture, and then you start the vertical sync again. And you have to do this continuously because if you stop, you don't generate a proper television program. We tell the chip to start generating the vertical sync signal, and you do this by writing to a particular memory location within that chip. It's mapped in, as we've talked about in the past. We then wait for three of the lines. So we've got a loop of three, and we wait for the horizontal sync to happen, and we count three, and then we turn it off. And then we start drawing the vertical bank, blank area in the same way we set a different location we wait 45 or so lines in a panel image to do that and then we can actually start drawing our graphics Let's just make it so we start the emulator for the first 128 lines or so we're literally just changing the color of the background on every line of the screen and then for the rest of the screen i've just filled it with white and again i'm counting the number of lines and then we stop and we start drawing this all again. So we have to code that in. The thing when programming the 2600, the phrase that people used was racing the beam. Because if your program got too long, it would get out of sync with the beam and it would delay things and it would appear at a different point. So does this mean that store a variable in the wrong place would actually affect the graphics? Yeah. So if you did particularly things, so storing a variable will take a constant amount of time. But for example, if you do make a decision, so you compare something, then you branch or you don't branch, they'll take different amounts of time or your code paths will have different lengths. And so in one way, you might delay things to not happen at the right point. There's two things you could do to sort of get out of that. Firstly, you've got the vertical blank. During that period, nothing's being displayed. So you can do all sorts of calculations there and not have to worry about it. You can sort of work out on average how many lines this bit of code is going to take because you know how long each clock cycle is compared to the video signal. So you sort of, you've got your video signal going and your CPU's going and you need to keep the track of how those things are until you get to the point where you think, okay, I've done everything, I've now got 30 lines left of the vertical blank, I can just wait for 30 lines. And So you're a slave to the display? Absolutely, yeah. If you, if you got things out of sync, the display would have whatever data was in there, what was on the previous line and would continue displaying it. And then you would get to that point and you could do things. Now the TIA chip, the Stellar chip, did have some things to help you. You had a background, which was just a colour, which was the basing it displayed. And then you could display on top of that various things. So there's something called the play field, which was 40 bits of graphics. You could program 20 bits of them, which would be displayed from the left half to the middle of the screen. And then it would either repeat them or reflect them over the other side. 
Remember the chip was designed to sort of create the sort of Pong or tank battle games that were popular in the late 70s. And everything else was people abusing the system that you provide to create more and more impressive games. So you had the sort of play fields. And if we turn this code back on, we can start drawing things into the play field. So I'm going to set the first four pixels to be on. And I'm going to set the second eight pixel set of eight pixels to be an oscillating pattern. The next set of eight pixels to be a different oscillating pattern. Uh, and then I'll reflect it or not reflecting it depending on which line I am on. So if we turn that on, we get a slightly different pattern displayed on screen. So we've still got our coloured bars as before, but now we're getting these white lines or gaps where we've turned on the play field. So that's like over the top of it, is it? Yeah. So we've got four bits here, and just notice how big these bits take up. They're sort of 40 bits across the whole thing. On this, we're either reflecting it or we're not. So we get a slightly different pattern appearing there. Basically, you've got the background color, then the play field for that line drawn on top of that. You've also got a ball that be drawn. Think of the Pong games, bing, 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 bing. You can have a player one and player two, and then each of them could have a missile that could be firing, and they appear on that line. And you can set them to be different widths and sizes based on the bits, patterns that you can draw, and you can sort of create the different graphics. I decided, okay, can I draw the computer file logo on a 2600? Can I write the code to do that? So I set things up, and I have a slightly more complicated program here. And I've got about halfway through it, so we'll sort of talk about how this works, and then we'll in a, another episode, we'll actually see if we can get this running on real hardware, see whether I'm actually generating a proper sync signal, probably not, um, looking at the code, and see whether it actually finish off drawing it. So I'm just using Playfield graphics here um, and so on. So what am I going to do? I'm going to draw a sort of sky colour, sort of cyan, bluey type colour. I'm going to have a flashing different colour ground, and then I'm going to draw the computer file sort of logo. And if we run it, we've got the graphics being drawn, and this is the play field. So on the first one, I have to set the play field up for eight lines or so in this position. Then I move on to set it up to draw it in this position and so on. And I'm changing the values that we're putting in there each time. Interesting, if you look here, it looks like I'm a bit late changing the background colour. And so we get a few pixels of blue being displayed before we get the psychedelia effect at the bottom here. That's almost certainly that my code's being slightly delayed in drawing that. You're drawing the left-hand side of the screen and then you're using a flag that mirrors it. Yeah, I am actually cheating. Does that mean that the middle bit is actually going to be quite difficult to draw? Yeah. So there's two possible ways I could do it. I could possibly do some of it in terms of the playfield graphics. So things like if I position things in the right place, the top bar and the bottom bar of the C, I could possibly do the playfield graphics. We'll try this out when I've actually got a real VCS or a real 2600. There's one on the way from eBay, and we'll see if we can get this to actually draw the full logo. So my current thoughts are I could perhaps draw the top bit and the bottom bit using the playfield graphics and position them to actually just set a couple of pixels here, get them reflected, that appear in the right place, and then perhaps abuse the balls or the missiles and so on to actually really racing the beam draw this side of the things. The other thing I could possibly do if I was clever is update the playfield graphics after it's displayed here and count the cycles of the CPU going to change what's displayed here by the time it gets there and sort of draw it using the playfield graphics. We'll have a bit of an experiment and we'll try it on real hardware and we'll see what actually works. But yeah, definitely kudos to the real people who actually spent ages working out how to create games like Pac-Man and so on. Their skills are pretty impressive, having spent some time. And of course, it's also worth remembering that you didn't just have to do this on the 2016, even on something like the ST or the Amiga, people were using similar tricks, racing the beam across to change the setup of the, either the sprite hardware on the Amiga or the display on the palettes and things on the ST to create graphics, which were technically beyond what the hardware should have been capable of producing but of course people had found tricks to do things so for example on the Amiga you had eight sprites that you could display on screw on a single line but of course if once it finished displaying one you could sort of move that to the other side of the screen before it got there and actually get things happening in the right place so yeah you had to count your cycles so sometimes your floppies would die so you often would make backup copies um, let's try this one 
Sounds more hopeful. And so there was this game called Lander, 